I feel like I should have champagne. Our first TV episode. Yeah, baby's first. Oh my god, I'm sweating. Like, actually. <laughs> <laughs> What's your story? What's your sign? It's like we're twin flames in a different life. Welcome everybody to Queer in Alberta, episode one for Tell a Story Hive. My name is Kelsey. I'm a queer Filipina Canadian and I use she, her pronouns. I am on Treaty 7 territory, which is traditionally the home of the Blackfoot Confederacy as well as the Métis Nation. I'm going to be your primary host throughout this series. Normally, I'm the one in the interviewer chair. Today, I have with me a dear friend that I met through the series and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. I'm Alyssa Takahashi. I am a non-binary lesbian. My my pronouns are they, them. I'm in a mask with Zeus Skyen, also known as Edmonton, Alberta. Um, I live here for most of my life. This is like role reversal, and it's really weird, and I'm a little nervous, but I'm excited to do it. I was thinking the exact same thing. I was like, wow, it's different from this chair. I'm really excited to see how you do. Right. Thanks. There's <laughs> absolutely no pressure. Zero pressure. <laughs> exactly. Um... I grew up in Bonneville, Alberta, so that's like a 5,000 population town, three and a half hours northeast of Edmonton. I came from a really religious and conservative family. It was um, very different. There was no conversation about queer people, and if gay people ever came up in particular, it was like a really negative thing. It really led me to being super blind about my identity. I didn't realize that I was gay until I was 17 years old. I had gone to a cast party because I was in musical theater in high school, surprising no one. And at the cast party, I had my first taste of alcohol and I watched one of my close friends at the time. She was like dancing to the music and like my face got so red and my heart started pounding in my chest and I was like, what is going on? And she like uh, beckoned for me to come over and dance with her. And I was like, hell no. And I ran <laughs> to the bathroom, full gay sprint. And this woman like follows me holding my face in her hands. And she's like, what's wrong? And the whole thing is just sending me into gay panic you know, the kind of joy and fun that I had experienced in like being free to kind of feel those feelings for the first time without all of these kind of blockers mm -hmm. that I'd had in my everyday life without even knowing it, that immediately evaporated and was replaced with like fear and shame and guilt in the 2010s in a small town there was so much stigma around being mm -hmm. queer or being gay and like people would accuse other people of being lesbians and from that really predatory lens. I was really afraid about what those feelings meant and I didn't understand them and I didn't feel like I had anybody that I could talk to about it. So I actually spent the rest of my senior year moping. Uh, I was very, very like, you know, confused and afraid. When I actually moved to university here in Lethbridge and it was like, you know what, I'm six and a half hours away from home. Nobody knows me. Like nobody knows about this girl that I had this whole thing with just to myself. <laughs> so I was like, you know what, I can so be straight. I can absolutely do that. And then I was like, no, this is, this is following me. Is Did I tell you about the cheerleaders? Oh my goodness, no, I wouldn't remember the cheerleaders. Oh my god, okay, so like, one of my friends in first year university, she was on the U of L dance team, so they would probably be offended if you called them cheerleaders, I apologize, but they were the dance team that yes. like came and did the halftime show at sports events, and so for her first time like debuting on the team, all of us from the floor that were her friends, we came to support her, and we made these signs, like everybody was so confused because it wasn't for an athlete, it was for this one chick on the dance team. <laughs> but then like this row of cheerleaders, dancers come out in formation for their routine and they're all like glammed up, gorgeous women. And I was like, I cannot look at this right now. This is too much. I like ran away to the bathroom and called my best friend at the time, just like panicking. And her brother is actually gay. And so she was like, Kelsey, there is nothing wrong with you. You are just gay. You just like girls. That was my sobering moment uh, due to the U of L dance team. Right? Shout out to them. Shout out doing, to them. Doing we would not work. be here for Queer in Alberta <laughs> without the U of L dance team. Absolutely. I, I think that's such an interesting point of like that that intense fear that I think is very common for people to feel. And then for someone to kind of put it as like, it's not a big deal, you just like girls. 
Mm-hmm. And it's like those two things because they're so far apart in your mind. Um, and I found that like super relatable. It, it feels like so much more. It makes it seem like this massive life altering issue, right? When instead of it being an issue, it's something to be celebrated and something as simple as you just like girls or whatever it is. I also think it's really interesting because I've heard aspects of your coming out story, but (laughs) it's hilarious how similar ours are because my (laughs) first like gay experience was at a cast party in grade 12. It's like the manual. You have to do it that way. Um, you mentioned your identity as a Filipina Canadian, mm-hmm. and I was curious how you've found that to impact your experience on um, being queer and coming out and living in Alberta. When I first came out, I don't think I understood how it affected my identity. Knowing oneself is something that you continue to do throughout a whole lifetime. But for me, and I think for you too, Alyssa, like we were really raised with this idea that we were white and that the Asian mm-hmm. part of who we are was discounted by that. When I first came out, I didn't really think about that factor of my identity in relation to my queerness. But the older I got and the more that I understood how certain experiences that I have day to day in Alberta that my white friends have never experienced is directly because of the fact that I'm mixed, I started Mm -hmm. to see that kind of reach into all of the different parts of my life, including my queerness. If I go to a space or an event, I'm always taking notice and seeing that I'm like the only person of color in a room and Mm -hmm. then feeling at the same time that like, and I'm half white. I struggle a lot as a mixed race person of color with that piece of authenticity. I see that echoed in the experiences of so many other mixed people that I've met throughout this experience and this project where we're afraid to step into our identity because we feel like we don't have the right to do that because we've been separate by whatever it is, whether it's whiteness or growing up in a different country. And Mm -hmm. I think that's so sad that a whole generation or group of people like us feel like we don't have the right to be. And that's something that I really want to do even the smallest amount that I can to begin to challenge in everyday spaces as well as queer spaces. Sometimes when I walk into a room, I feel like I'm too many things. So which part of my identity are are either safe in this situation or going to be most palatable and it's so nice to be in conversations with people in spaces where all of those things are celebrated or even just acknowledged because we contain multitudes or not one aspect of our identity at any time we just finished our christmas season our holiday season here in canada and that can be a really contentious and sometimes difficult time especially for queer people i love my family more than anything in the entire world but we have different views. My dad in particular was really struggling and clashing with me. And for us, it's a bit of a privilege in a way to be able to say, I'm not gonna take up space with this particular aspect of my identity because we can hide it. And some people can't hide it, whether it's like you're really visibly presenting as queer or you have darker skin and features than I do. I feel really guilty in those moments because I don't wanna palette myself for my father and his sensitivities as a cisgendered, white, heterosexual man, when I know that so many people from our community never have that chance or option to make it easier. There, there is always someone else who has something that's more complex. There is also um, kind of a nuance and a complexity to people who are in those situations where they're passing and that aspect of their identity isn't seen. Mm-hmm. It's, it's such a complex issue and I feel like even as a queer community, we're just starting to kind of scratch the surface of what that means. And I remember when we did my interview, um, mm. I was kind of trying to figure, like I was at a different place of navigating all that. And I remember you actually really gave me that space and you were like, you know, uh-huh. your identity is valid and you are who you are and, mm. and there's, there's a seat for you at the table. And I think that's one of the biggest things that we can do as people of color for each other. your representation did you see growing up specifically in Alberta? The year is 1999. (laughs) I am in my parents' farmhouse in Bashaw, Alberta. My mother is choosing a VHS for her children to watch. One is Teletubbies, one is Mickey Mouse. She chooses Mickey Mouse because she has read an article about how the Teletubbies The little symbols on their heads are actually pro-gay, and she's afraid that if her children watch the Teletubbies, 
they will turn gay. Yes. Plot twist, Elsa. The year is now 2023. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly it was the Mickey Mouse symbol. Clearly, that that's gay. what did it. So yeah, mm -hmm. I knew from a young age. I was like, I wasn't allowed to watch Teletubbies because my parents didn't want me to be gay. Exactly. And yet... And yet she persisted. Mm -hmm. We never talked about gay people, queer people, the 2S, LGBTQI plus community. When we were, I think, growing up, I think the phrase, that's so gay, was really, really thrown around quite a bit. I don't know mm -hmm. if it still is today to the same degree. A no, little bit? I don't think to the same degree, but teaching junior high, it's, mm -hmm. it's not something you don't hear. There was this girl in high school that like people wouldn't want to be alone with her in the change room because they were worried that she'd be like checking them out. It was quite malicious and based on stereotypes. So often to that like stereotype of a predatory gay. Mm -hmm. If there was representation on shows, like that was pretty much it. And we were never allowed to watch anything um, that like would have had gay representation, but it started mm -hmm. to sneak into my life in different ways because I watched Pretty Little Liars like everybody oh, else yeah. did. And I think um, Emily Fields, the character who is a lesbian, mm -hmm. she was probably one of my first introductions to seeing a lesbian on TV. And mm -hmm. I didn't understand how that made me feel. Like I was obsessed with it, obviously. Right. Absolutely. Have you seen Shay Mitchell? If you want to talk about <laughs> iconic queer Filipina Canadian representation, there you go. I think that I like convinced myself I was like, it's just because she's Asian. Yes. <laughs> I'd watch Pretty Little Liars like not on TV with my family, but I had oh, yeah. a laptop that like I rented from the school. And I would literally just like be in my bedroom for hours into the night, like watching Pretty Little Liars. Queer media started to come into my life, but I still didn't get it for me. I didn't understand. Mm -hmm why I liked it so much or even think that I liked it that much because right. then that opens a whole door that I was not ready for. And I think that raises a, a good point in this idea like I, I was not allowed to watch a lot of things because it mm -hmm. would make me gay. Which, first of all, the TV show can make someone gay. They maybe already are. I'm just playing that. I, I kind of dived right into what I thought queerness was supposed to be, realized it didn't fit for me, and then started to not only begin to redefine what does being queer mean to me, but what does being a woman mean to me? I was never a girly girl. Um, I was I was a tomboy when I was little, or that yeah. was the word that we have for it. And then once I came out as non-binary, that was the first time I actually felt excited to embrace my more feminine side. I never used to, like you said, I never used to wear pink or anything mm -hmm. like that. I had to wear dresses and skirts to church. But now that I'm in this different space, I feel way less challenged to explore my femininity. Um, and I right? find it a much more beautiful thing because it's not, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to look like one thing or that doesn't make me a woman. Whether it's femininity or queer expression, I find that because this started on TikTok, I reference TikTok a lot. Yeah. And I see that there's so much like, this is a cottage core lesbian or a dark academia lesbian or what have you, like all of these boxes, whether you're young or just coming out, but you're trying to figure out your identity, these categories can be really helpful. But at the same time, they can be so restricting when you don't exist inside of that. And when yes. that's all you see, you think that there's something missing and you feel like you need to conform. I really want to drop kick the heck out of that idea because yeah. queerness doesn't have one look or experience or expression. And that's harmful when we only see it from these kind of touchstone moments that are popular and often mm -hmm. pioneered by white creators or people. Something that I've learned a lot lately uh, about allyship, I've learned from my sister. We weren't that close growing up, but in the last, mm -hmm. once we became adults, we started getting closer. And then within the last year, our relationship has become something that, that I never mm -hmm. imagined it could be. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really only come out as non-binary in the last year or so. Is that I think it's even changed since our first interview. Yeah, you were um, just thinking about it when yeah, we first chatted. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, and my sister has been my biggest champion, like mm -hmm. other than my wife. Um, and I didn't really expect that from my sister. And the number of difficult conversations that she has chosen to take on and then tells me about afterward, I have no idea it's happened. Um, mm -hmm. Especially with our parents. Like my parents are loving people. I have a great relationship with them. Um, but again, I was like, they're older. I don't think they're really going to get this. And so when I came out, I kind of gave them that pass. I was like, you know, I'm still your kid. 
you don't use my pronouns, you know, mm-hmm. it's fine, whatever. And then my sister uh, at Christmas, I guess, she stayed later to talk to them and was like, Alyssa gave you a pass. They shouldn't have. You mm. need to, you know, be respectful and, and notice these things. And the text my mom sent me afterward was beautiful. And and then all my sister said to me was like, hey, talk to mom. And then I was like, dude, you didn't just, like, you, you went to battle for me mm-hmm. and stood up and, and nothing she said was like it wasn't a battle it was an open conversation but yeah the fact that she did that like I was really trying to work up to it and I was like I don't know how I'm gonna do this and then she did it and, and she did it and and the the mental load that she took from my plate was huge it's those conversations like you're saying that they go a long way and if it's if it's not uncomfortable for you it's a lot for us. It makes me think of my brother over this recent Christmas holidays. My brother has never, like, I think, openly told my dad in particular that he's supportive of the fact that I'm gay. And so the two of them were outside of the house. And my dad just was really upset. And he was talking about, like, how, you know, in the Bible, it says it should be with a man and a woman so that you can have children. And my brother was like, okay, what does that mean for every straight couple that chooses not to have children? Or Mm -hmm. maybe they can't have children. Are they doing something wrong? And, you know, kind of starting the process of speaking Mm -hmm. up. And um, my brother eventually got to the point where he was like, I don't think there's anything wrong with Ate, which, you know, in our culture, you call someone who's like your big sister Ate. He was like, I don't think there's anything wrong with Ate liking girls. And my dad was really, really shocked by that. And he was like, you're an advocate for your sister. And JR was like, "Mm mm-hmm. And my dad was like, I don't know if I could ever be an advocate for her. Mm -hmm. And so that was painful to hear. But the fact that my brother like stood up for me and was like, showing that this is not just an isolated Kelsey issue, that mm-hmm. something's wrong with her for thinking this way, and instead being like, no, I support her to my father. Oh, huge. That is huge. Mm-hmm. Wow, way to go. Yeah, he's pretty so, great. So, so this is for all of the siblings. siblings. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I want to also acknowledge that like, my father is a wonderful, wonderful person, and I think mm-hmm. part of the labor that I have to do is understanding that his views come from the world that he grew up in. So he grew up in a small, isolated farming community in central Alberta, very intensely religious. And that's where that's coming from, right? Mm -hmm. It's just a different generation. And even if he is saying that at this point, he won't be able to quote unquote advocate for me or support me. As you know, Alyssa, my mom, who I came out to nearly 10 years ago, also said those things to me and she just met my girlfriend Sarah for the first time and we had a meal together and it wasn't perfect conversation was not flowing but (laughs) the fact that it happened right like I never thought it would and so this is me like if my dad ever watches this (laughs) I'm just like I'm not giving up hope that someday we'll be able to have a meal together If anybody is watching who maybe comes from a family where it's not like you go home for Christmas and it's a easy, easy time, um, you're allowed to grieve that. You're allowed to be upset about that. Um, But I think the one piece of caution that I would give is get to a place with it where you can be at peace. So you can still have those moments of, you know, those bad days, but it shouldn't be something that dominates your life or takes away from all your life could and should be because even if you're going home for the holidays or something like that you are still a person who deserves to be treated with respect and absolutely dignity and, mm-hmm. and so if that isn't going home for the holidays or a big thing or whatever that's valid It's okay. Yeah. And that also is like, maybe that's the white part of us. That's like, you cannot go home for the holiday. Right. Right. Immediately. Like my other part was like, uh, -uh. (laughs) we have to go with our family. (laughs) Mm. What would you want to tell your younger self? I knew this was coming. (laughs) Or what would you cry to your younger self? <laughs> yeah, isn't that right? Yeah. Um, well, I think it makes a lot of sense now. But when I was a teenager, I was really, really depressed. And I was living in that small town. And I didn't feel like I fit in for so many different reasons that I 
completely didn't understand at that point, not even just for being queer, but for being mixed. I didn't feel like I knew who I was, and so it makes sense that everything in my life felt like it was a mess. I think it would be really interesting to go back in time and see my younger self and be like, hey, you're not white. You are a mixed Filipina Canadian, and that's why these things happen to you and not to your other friends. But the thing you need to know about it and remind yourself of, even in your 20s, is that this is a fundamentally and profoundly beautiful experience to have, no matter what side, whether it's your Filipino side or your white side, that tries to take away who you are based on being two things instead of one. Mm -hmm. No matter what other people try and tell you, you have to learn to block it out because you simply are. And the second thing is you are gay. You are so <laughs> gay. <laughs> so gay. Is there anything that we didn't touch on that, that you would like to before we part ways? <laughs> Make it sound so morbid. I like, know, right? see each other ever again. This is why I don't usually do the interview. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, like, the main thing is this is kind of what you can expect. So, you're going to hear from, with this series, five or six other queer Albertans. We have Indigenous representation, two spirit representation, limb differences. We've also got, like, it's, it's a lot. There's also an episode where we have someone who's really young who's speaking about coming out as trans at a young age and the school system, how they're supported. So we have some great, great episodes coming your way. A shout out for Alyssa. Obviously they did amazing, but if you want to keep in touch with them and everything they're doing, what social media would you like to share? Absolutely. So uh, I'm on Instagram. I have mm -hmm. two. I have one that's public um, and it's at just Takahashi. Uh, my last name is T-A-K-A-H-A-S-H-I. Uh, that's my like public Instagram that my students follow and things like that. So if you were to message me or wanna wanna kind of see what's going on, um, that's probably the best place. You can follow me on TikTok with the username at underscore Kelsifer. So that is underscore K E L S I F E R. If you want to see the other Queer in Alberta episodes that were already released pre this Story Hive season, you go on to YouTube and look up Queer in Alberta and. That should be me. If there's somebody mm -hmm. else doing it, we may have to investigate that. Um, and it's also available as a podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Google, like all of it. I went nuts. And of course, Alyssa's original episode, I think it's season one, episode four mm -hmm. is there. And we get into a whole conversation about race and identity and your own coming out story. So if you loved Alyssa, definitely go look at that episode. Dreamers, don't give up.